Thank you, Lee. Thank you, Sane Energy um, and the New School. Thank you, everyone, for organizing this. It's really, it's really great to be here to speak about this. Um, I'll just first, I want to let folks know what my research question was and my research process was with this story. So I write about issues of science and the environment. I spent a lot of time uh, in Louisiana, lived there for about five years and covered the oil and gas industry, the petrochemical industry. And then more recently, about two years ago, moved uh, back up to New York State. And the big environmental issue was uh, fracking, Marcellus gas development. Um, and as I would be reporting in communities, the issue of radioactivity would come up in conversation. Um, it's such a powerful word and a complicated word that I didn't initially digest it. There's so much to cover in fracking. There's so much infrastructure. There's so much happening. Um, you can only focus on one thing. And so I kind of put the radioactivity to the side. But eventually, when I found out that in Ohio and Pennsylvania and New York, um, they're, they're literally using brine, which has a high radioactive signature, to spread on roads in an effort to keep down dust or to melt snow and ice. When I found out that, I, I realized I need to really dive in and examine this. So my question was, um, let's look at the radioactivity brought to the surface in oil and gas production and determine what are the many different pathways of contamination posed to the industry's workers, the public and communities, and the environment. Um, and the research process was find articles, find research articles on this issue. There's actually quite a lot um, when you start looking and interview the scientists, if they're still around, follow the articles that those scientists lead me to in conversations, um, read the interesting citations in the good articles, and, and then follow the citations from there, and just leapfrog and, and continue, really, um, to go down this rabbit hole. And one other thing I want to say is it's so important groups like Sane Energy, and I know there's other groups represented here as well um, who have helped sponsor the event and helped um, organize this event. But in general, like, these groups are so important. I would not be able to have the information I had were it not for people in communities risking um, sometimes you know, their own personal health, but certainly their reputations often in the communities to gather information, to pay attention, to be aware. Uh, often journalists will say like, well, I don't talk to the activists. Um, and I'm like, are you kidding me? These are not activists. These are people with the courage to care. And if they're not there documenting, if they're not there doing records requests um, and, and just observing things, whether it's with their phones, with a camera, with their own bodies, you know, I have nothing to go on. So that's the first line of the investigative journalism uh, organism. And if you don't understand that, which many people don't, you're going to miss everything. Um, so I just want to start with a quote here. A lot of great experts I was led to in this uh, reporting. And, and really one of the best here is Dr. Marco Keltofen. This is someone who's been studying radioactivity issues uh, for 20 years, covering uh, initially the nuclear industry, now looking at oil and gas radioactivity. And I think this quote just tells it so um, crisply. Uh, essentially, what you are doing is taking an underground radioactive reservoir and bringing it up to the biosphere where it can interact with people and the environment. That is oil and gas development. We imagine it as something very different. Um, but when you understand this topic, you recognize that this is what's happening also. And, and it's not, you know, regulators, industry will try and say it's complicated. No, it's not complicated. You're bringing a radioactive reservoir up into the area where humans live and interact. Um, and, and we go from there, but, but it's as simple and yet um, not simple as that. So little diagram. Um, amazingly, there's no textbook on this topic. Um, I went out to Colorado School of Mines, which is like, I don't know, whatever the top school you want to say, the Harvard of the oil and gas industry. They do not have a course on oil and gas radioactivity, which I think is absurd. Um, so I have to do my own diagrams. Um, but I'm just trying to give everyone an idea of what are the different ways radioactivity can come to the surface at an oil and gas wellhead. Um, and I think the first thing to recognize is that there's a lot more than oil and gas coming to the surface at an oil and gas wellhead. You have an incredible amount of waste. Uh, and one of the primary waste streams is this toxic, salty liquid that the industry innocently calls produced water or brine. 
Um, and brine, if you spend time in Pennsylvania or any area where there's a lot of oil and gas development, you often see these trucks, a brine truck. Um, brine has high levels of salt, it has toxic heavy metals, it has volatile organics like uh, benzene, known human carcinogens, and it also has the radioactive element, radium, uh, in concentrations that can be extraordinarily high. And radium is there because um, radium is soluble. Radium will flow with water. Many radioactive elements down in the earth, like uranium, for example, less likely to flow with water, but radium will flow with water. And because brine has this very high salt content, it actually enables even more radium to um, get into that stream and flow with water. So if you go to an oil and gas wellhead, you'll have, you know, uh, the wellhead apparatus, and right next to it, you'll have whatever product that's being collected. If it's oil, there'll be an oil tank, um, and then you'll see a brine tank. And other things coming to the surface as well, I'll get to that a bit later in the talk, but just to go over this now, drill cuttings. Um, this is, you know, if you drill a hole, you're inherently digging up a lot of soil. The soil brought to the surface is called drill cuttings. Scale, this is a really hard gunk that can build up in a pipeline. And because you have so much radioactivity coming up through these pipelines, you're inevitably gonna have a highly radioactive scale. And this is one of the first ways that the industry actually realized that they had a radioactivity problem, is that workers who were cleaning the scale out of these pipelines, and I'm talking right now about the vertical pipeline that literally brings the oil and gas to the surface. These pipelines would develop a scale. Workers would then be cleaning off that scale. No, no um, respiratory equipment, no protective gear. And, and if you're cleaning off scale, you're creating a lot of dust. As you remove it from that pipe, they were breathing in this dust, and these workers were getting very sick. What was happening is they were ingesting radium. Radium is uh, what's called a bone seeker. It has a similar chemical makeup as calcium. Uh, and so if you accidentally ingest it, if you accidentally inhale it, and it's quite easy to do that if you're in a dusty environment, um, some of it will actually lodge in your bones. Your body will take it into the bones, thinking it's calcium, thinking it's something helpful, it's not, and then you'll have a radioactive element in your bones, and it will continue, of course, it's radioactive decay, blasting out radiation internally. Um, that's scale. And then the last part, which I think really connects to the concerns here in New York, is the product itself. Oil and gas, especially natural gas and natural gas liquids, um, radioactivity will actually flow with the product. And of course, this is all, um, it's fine to be wowed by this. Every one of these steps was um, just a, a, a mind-blowing revelation for me. And now I'm trying to put it together in a way where it you know, adds up and makes sense. But it's, it's a lot of new information. Um, but what's great is the industry has actually written about all this. So, we can tell it in their own words. Um, so just to talk about levels, because appropriately, um, and any question is great on this topic, that's how you know, I've gotten to this point, but the question of levels, how, what are we dealing with, how worrisome, how much radium? So uh, our own government is so worried about radium that um, the EPA has set a safe drinking water limit at five. So that's in a unit called Pico Carries per liter, um, and we'll just remember five. So worrisome, we don't want more than five. That's a very minuscule amount. Um, Pico carries per liter. Nuclear Regulatory Commission has a discharge limit, two different common types, common isotopes of radium uh, in brine. For each isotope, that limit's 60. You add it together, 120. So our limit's five, 120. Uh, and EPA, this came to me recently in an EPA uh, in exchange with an EPA spokesperson, liquid waste containing radium uh, 226 or 228, these are the two different isotopes, above 60, that's picocuries per liter, that's defined as radioactive. So the EPA, above 60, they're calling radioactive. Uh, anything above five, not supposed to be in drinking water. And here are the levels for the brine, this innocent word brine, um, in various oil and gas plays across the country. Um, so, one important thing to note, they're all a lot higher than any of the levels. Um, but even the Gulf Coast, conventional oil and gas wells that we've been harvesting for decades, um, you see the levels are really, really high, 3,087. Um, and, and so I think it's important to note, even in my own research, this idea, oh, this is a fracking issue. There's reasons why 
fracking can bring even more radioactivity to the surface, and I'll get to that. But this issue goes beyond fracking. Oil and gas production, inevitably, if you're in a play where the signature is high, is going to bring radioactivity to the surface. And you see this, in this um, through this list. Some plays, some um, oil and gas plays, such as the denver Julesburg big play out in Colorado, levels are a good bit lower, but still above any of those limits. Go down to the bottom, the Marcellus is the highest known signature um, in my research, at least, and I haven't seen any levels higher than that. 28,500, that's a high level, and that's coming from a Pennsylvania Department of Environmental Protection report. Um, and these are the highest recorded readings. It's easier to get these readings because so few readings have been taken, it's very difficult to determine an average. Um, so that's why I stuck with highest. The average in this Pennsylvania Department of Environmental Protection report where these numbers are, the average was about 9,000. So even the average brine in the Marcellus is well above, just to go back again, 5, 120, 60. Um, so then we get to the question, uh, like how is it possible? I mean, if you've been out in these areas, you see these trucks and they look like this. So picture on the left, um, this is an injection well. So what happens to the brine? Um, initially, in the early days of the industry, brine was literally just kind of like slopped off into the bayou if you're in Louisiana. Literally, um, that's what would happen. Eventually, radium started building up in oysters. Um, just, you know, and, and different bio accumulation. Louisiana got very worried about that. Oysters are a big industry, just like oil and gas was a big industry. And that actually led to some good regulations. But point is, it can build up in the environment. Industry stopped just putting it directly into the environment. Now what happens is a lot of the brine is put into a truck, taken to what's called an injection well, and shot back into the earth. Maybe once it's to the surface, putting it back into the earth is possibly the best thing to do with it, even though there's all sorts of problems associated with injection wells. But the problem is you, you have a radioactive substance, and it's in a truck. So this is, um, on the left, that injection well is in a shopping mall in Cambridge, Ohio. You can, and I sat, because I met a worker, um, an industry worker, a truck driver, we met at a Taco Bell um, for breakfast, which um, was interesting to begin with, but then we're like sitting there eating breakfast at the Taco Bell, and we could watch trucks unload brine, like right at the back of the shopping mall. Um, on the right side, this is really beautiful town in Ohio, Barnesville, Ohio, that's their main intersection, and that's a brine truck, and you see the words residual, and then there's a word on the back, it says, I believe it says brine. And that's your, the only warning you have that you're dealing with something that has these extraordinary levels of um, radium. And that's aside from all the other toxic heavy metals, carcinogens, um, and, and also you know, potentially fracking, fracking chemicals that might have come up as well. Um, so how, is, how can these trucks go through a downtown? And I just want to point out, and I'll get to this later too, but I mean, this is concerning on a number of reasons. It's concerning because for anyone who lives in this town, it, these trucks crash regularly. In Ohio, not far from Barnesville, a, a brine truck actually crashed right next to a reservoir. Um, and brine spilled across a farmer's field and then went into a reservoir. Um, but the drivers who are driving these trucks are at an extraordinary risk. They are told that they're hauling water. Um, and, and this is absolutely you know, devastating. I mean, they are being deceived. They are not being told that they are hauling radioactive waste. And because of that, there's no onus on the employer to appropriately protect them. Um, and they are some of my um, main sources in this story. They are coming out even more so since the story has been published with Rolling Stone. And they're very concerned about their health, um, and I'll get to some of their jobs. They, they have good right to be concerned, but um, this is so important right now. So this is how really much of this is possible. Halliburton loophole, which was just mentioned, is really uh, significant, but we actually go back even, for, uh, even before that. So the late 1970s, the U.S. is trying to deal with its industrial waste, and this was a really great idea. The Resource Conservation and Recovery Act is this idea that as a nation we will produce industrial waste. Some of it will be quite hazardous, but at least we're going to appropriately label it as hazardous. We're going to recognize the hazardous waste as hazardous. We're going to put it into appropriately designed trucks, take it to an appropriate landfill meant to store hazardous waste. Um, but oil and gas waste received a stunning exemption. 
Uh, and the Benson and Bevel Amendment, that's the name of this exemption. And what's wild is the EPA actually looked at this exemption in the late 1980s and they determined, um, th they looked through some of the constituents of oil and gas waste. They knew that there was uranium in there. They knew that there was various toxic heavy metals. It was quite hazardous, but if we were to label it as hazardous, um, and these are the EPA's own words, it would cause a severe economic impact on the industry um, furthermore, it would cause a permitting burden. Uh, there'd be an issue, there literally wouldn't be enough t places to take the waste, there wouldn't be enough regulators to regulate it, um, it would hinder the search for new oil and gas deposits. So therefore, we're gonna have to, sorry humans of the future, we're gonna have to label it as non-hazardous. So that's why you can have a truck drive through a town where kids are going to school, where people are walking, and all it says is brine, because by the letter of the law in the United States, that is not hazardous material. It does not matter how much radium, how much arsenic, things we, we know is in there, how much benzene, um, it, it's not hazardous. And some of the biggest, um, you know, one, one of the, the biggest, one of the best sources in my story who is fighting this, um, and I know we have at least one in the audience, is a fire chief. Because if you are a fire chief and you go to a truck that's overturned, uh, or you're a first responder and there's no sign, you have no idea what you're dealing with. You see the word brine, and yet there's radium, there's arsenic, there's, there's radioactivity. You need to be appropriately informed, and, and they're not. And, they, and the industry has every right to not inform them because the law is on their side. Um, so, and these are just some of the things, and I think this is important to mention in any talk with a group that's you know, concerned about climate change. Um, here we have some people weighing in. What would happen if you close that loophole? Put the industry out of business. Um, disaster. This is really interesting. The last note is a study that this nuclear physicist, Marvin Resnikoff, who's done a lot of work on the Marcellus, he actually looked at what it would cost if you had to take some of these trucks instead of, um, and he's actually looking now at drill cuttings, some of this um, material that comes up out of, out of an oil and gas well when you drill. Drill cuttings come up in the Marcellus, they can be radioactive. Right now they're going to community landfills. So what would be the cost difference if instead they had to go to appropriate places for low level radioactive waste and it's a hundred fold increase in cost, um, which you know obviously changes the cost calculus of this whole industry. Um, so we're getting now to pipelines, which is I know the topic of interest here. Um, but again, I think no one says it better than the industry themselves. So here's the Oil and Gas Journal, prominent journal, um, 1990, radioactive materials could pose problems for the gas industry. And so I know people are starting to take this issue to their local leaders, to regulators, which is fantastic. And I know what the regulators are going to tell you because I know what they tell me. It's not a problem. We're looking into it. We've covered it. We don't have that much evidence. Well, they're wrong. Their own papers express concern. So here's some quotes from the Oil and Gas Journal. Norm, by the way, is what the industry and regulators call um, oil and gas radioactivity. It stands for naturally occurring radioactive materials. So me being a writer, um, and words are so important, I've, I've got to give it to them. Like those geniuses, they, they call something devastating like that norm. Wow. So you just, like, it's boring, you kind of skip right over it. Um, they do that all the time. In varying degrees of severity, norm contamination may exist at every oil and gas production site and related facilities, including pipe handling yards. So that's handling the pipe I was talking about before and related um, metal reclamation areas, natural gas and NGL pipelines, news to many people, gasoline plants and NGL refineries and terminals. So this is so significant because it conveys that the radioactivity spans the whole arc of the oil and gas production cycle. It's not just a wellhead issue. The brine certainly is, and the radium in the brine is a wellhead issue, and it's an issue for a truck carrying brine. Um, landfills taking the drill cuttings, it's an issue, but it, it's following through the pipeline system. And here that's being described in a very prominent industry publication. Here's another one. This is interesting. I did not know the American Petroleum Institute had a Department of Medicine and Biology, at least in the early 1980s they did. And they came out with what is a fantastic paper, an analysis of the impact of the regulation of radionuclides as a hazardous air pollutant on the petroleum industry. So what they're, you know, read the detail there. They're looking at, oh wow, what happens if this was regulated? Uh, and we're really worried that radioactivity is gonna be regulated, so let's go through our whole production cycle and see where we would have to s suddenly pay attention. So because of this self-reflection, 
you know, I and now everyone has this really um, behind the scenes look at the industry analyzing the radioactivity from through their own eyes. So here's some quotes from that paper. Almost all materials of interest and use to the petroleum industry contain measurable quantities of radionuclides that reside finally in the processing equipment, product streams, or waste. Um, so again, just laying out this idea that it is goes through the whole system. And now getting to the issue, which becomes the point of concern in pipelines, Radon 222 and its daughters caused the most severe impact to the public health. And then it is concluded that the regulation of radionuclides could impose a severe burden on API member companies. Um, it absolutely could. So just to focus on the radon for a second, this is another, um, another one of my drawings. And I'm trying to lay out the downstream oil and gas radioactivity risks. So remember radium, we talked about radium and we had the numbers. Um, any radioactive element goes through what's called a decay, um, where, in which it literally blasts off radiation, which is just pieces of itself. So a radioactive element is unstable, and when it decays, it just means it's blasting off a small piece of itself, and then literally after that, it's something else. So when radium-226 blasts off a piece of itself in the form of an alpha particle, it then becomes radon-222, which is, is really extraordinary. And, and um, radon-222, you're still in the middle of this very long decay chain, which starts with uranium-238. Um, so radium will flow with brine to the surface. It's soluble, flows with water, and then radium will decay to radon. Radon is a gas, and it's what's called a noble gas. It is completely fine with its own uh, structure, its own chemical structure. So it, it's not likely to bond to something. So radon will flow right through the gas stream, right through the ethane stream. And so thus you have radon in a natural gas pipeline, in a natural um, gas liquids pipeline. And if you think about your kitchen sink uh, and think about where gunk comes up, like where the pipe turns or where pressure change where pressure changes you're likely to build up crud and it's uh and or where there's a filter and it's really the same thing with the gas stream so where you have a compressor station you have all sorts of pumps and valves that are moving the gas these are places then that are going to be processing this gas stream in some cases filtering it in some cases help moving the, uh, helping the gas move around a bend these are places where you're going to be accumulating the daughter products of radon so radon has a very quick half-life it continues to decay, and it goes through a series of very quick decays, and it will become lead-210, which is a radioactive isotope of lead, and lead-210, and a daughter of lead-210, polonium-210, a very concerning radioactive element, is what will be building up in the pumps, valves, and filters at all of these places, compressor stations, natural gas pipelines, natural gas processing plants, ethane cracker plants, all of this is laid out in the industry's own words in the two reports I just uh, mentioned. Uh, and so I put at the end of this list, natural gas fired power plants with a question mark. They weren't looked at in the early 1990s, I think probably because there just weren't a lot of them around. But if you follow the science, you certainly would imagine that the pumps, valves, and filters at natural gas fired power plants are gonna be building up radioactivity as well. Um, and then home stoves, right, if you're running gas, uh, that's often the end use is a home stove. What is the concern? Um, right now, we do not have the science to tell you uh, what that concern is. In 1973, the EPA actually looked at this issue. Um, so we do know, the EPA knows that there's radon in natural gas and that some of it, small amount, would come up in a home stove. And here is their paper where they looked at it. So this is 1973. And I bring this up because this is the last time this question was addressed. Um, this is such a significant question. In New York City and across the Northeast, we are now using gas that is coming from the Marcellus, where the levels are significantly higher, and the people telling us we're safe, if they even know this study exists, are falling back on a 47-year-old study. And here is, towards the conclusion of that study, they say, the fundamental problem in an analysis of potential health effects as derived in this study, this 1973 study, um, is that we're trying to extrapolate from a few measurements or reported values to average conditions for large populations. Without more supporting data, some of the estimates used in this analysis 
may not represent average conditions. Other values may be overly conservative. So not only is the study half a century old, the study itself admits that the science was not appropriate and was not fully representative at that time. Furthermore, they did not even test pipelines uh, or wellheads uh, in the Northeast. So this, uh, you, you know, this um, uh, completely, I'm just trying to think of an adjective for the study. Um, you know, it wasn't a fully comprehensive analysis, and yet that is what we're relying on now. So I just want to point out, upper left, you're looking at a radioactive gas from crude petroleum. So this is a study done in 1904, um, and this was the first scientific study in which radioactive, radioactivity in oil and gas was found. Um, it was a very elegant and simple study. They went to a farmer's field in southern Ontario. They um, took a sample of crude oil, and there was this gas emanating out, and they ran it through a bunch of pipes and put a photographic plate there, and the gas made an impression on the plate, such as a radioactive gas would, uh, which let them know that it was radioactive. A sci science students could do this today, um, and it would be an extraordinary study, but we haven't. We have not replicated this 116-year-old study. So the science is there to um, look at this question in detail. The science is not complicated. If we had access to wellheads, we could do it. If we had access to the pipelines, we could test at the pipelines. Um, and this has not been done. And the fact that this has not been done and was done in 1904 is, is outrageous. Um, and so you cannot say the science is complicated. Um, again, it would be a really fantastic project for any student group if they had access to a wellhead. Well, while we're here on this slide, we can focus on this. So we, I talked about what the right end decays to, lead and polonium. Here again, industry's own words. This was a conference just last year uh, in which a norm expert, there's that word again, um, spoke on the radioactivity issue. And they're talking about how much lead and polonium is building up in the filters in gas pipelines. So this is 1,200,000 picocuries per gram. Again, picocuries, we're looking now at a gram, not a liter. Um, we don't really even have limits for p uh, polonium, but you can use radium as a bit of a guide. The radium limit in topsoil at Superfund sites is five picocuries per gram. And we have polonium, according to this industry expert, building up in natural gas pipelines in the filters at 1,200,000 picocuries per gram. This is completely unassessed. This industry report exists, um, but is FERC looking at this or any agency when they consider a pipeline? No. So why does that matter? It matters because there are human beings who clean out the pipelines. It's called picking work. There are human beings who clean out um, all of the tanks, all of this equipment that's getting gunked up with radioactivity. And so we'll go back to this picture now. Um, so this is a brine hauler. This is someone who hauls the brine from the wellhead to the injection well. That job wouldn't necessarily be that dangerous, although when they're loading the truck up, they might get some exposure. Um, often drivers tell me, you know, that they're not wearing respirator, they're not wearing gloves often, um, and they'll, um, or, or at least not gloves that are fully waterproof, and then they'll, while their truck is loading, eat lunch. Um, that's a bad exposure, but the worst exposure is that they actually have to go into the tanks. And so this is a driver, he's just done this job, which in Ohio they call swamping, where they literally crawl into the brine truck with like a squeegee and a shovel and get the solids that will naturally settle out of the brine. So this potentially is gonna be the most worrisome uh, material. It's settled out of the brine. Brine is very gunky material. It's not this streamlined liquid. Um, and every so often, a couple days, um, they have to do that job. And, and obviously, I mean, that's the equipment they're wearing. This is their protective gear. They're covered in brine. Um, th and this driver has been told that they're, that they're hauling water, that this job isn't dangerous. And this is a quote, because um, uh, this is someone who has come out recently, and this is a photo from Facebook of a colleague of theirs. And I asked them, you know, well, how do you stand this? Because the chemical, the smell is gonna be horrendous. You're gonna wanna pass out as soon as you go into that truck. You know, and there's this idea these guys will challenge each other to spend a lot of times in there trying to be tough. If you complain to your boss, they'll say, shut up, don't like it, go home. This sort of thing is used time and again. I just had another worker who conveyed to me, they were brine hauling their hands were so swollen that they couldn't even drive their truck 
anymore. Um, a lot of drivers will get these odd swellings that emerge. A lot of drivers will get rashes, strange rashes, which kind of jump around the body. Um, and that driver immediately, the driver who complained about their hands being swollen was fired that day. Um, so I just think this is such an important part of the picture. Now, I have not had a lot of time to interview the people who do the picking work. Um, I do have one source um, who's described to me that work. And again, this is important because if you are permitting a pipeline, not only are you permitting all of the other issues that I know many people have now become well informed on that are associated with a pipeline, but you are permitting something that the industry well knows is going to be building up radioactivity. Um, and it's kind of like you, you lose either way. If you don't have radon coming out through your home, um, you know, maybe the EPA can do that study, update it, and determine, you know what, it's not coming out through the home. Well, that means that the daughter products are in the pipeline. It's going to be somewhere. It's either going to be in the pipeline or coming up through your home. Workers will have to clean that out. The workers who do the pigging work, who do that, uh, it's just as sloppy, uh, and often they can be as uninformed as this worker. And none of that analysis is being done when these projects are permitted. Um, and I'm gonna wind it down with that and leave room for a lot of questions, but I'll say that I produced um, this cool little booklet that I'm calling the Radioactive Cookbook, which enables people to take these sorts of questions to regulators. They're specific questions on the radioactivity associated with pipelines, natural gas pipelines, natural gas liquid pipelines, compressor stations, ethane cracker plants, People are not aware, and the idea of the cookbook is to make you aware and then give you specific questions to ask regulators. Um, and I just want to end on really what was the most devastating thing to find uh, in this reporting process, which is that you know I have photos of workers like that, and the question, the concern always was like, um, you know, is it making people sick? And um, and and and. And people have, you know, they have swollen hands, they have rashes, they have different things they're experiencing. Um, I know the science and I know that I should be worried, but, but it is, can this really hurt you? And this was um, a, just a horrible thing to find. There's a set of Louisiana legal cases in which 33 oil and gas workers working pretty run-of-the-mill jobs, roughneck, roused about, uh, a pipe cleaner, a truck driver hauling sludge, not so different than the photo of the driver we just saw, um, and these drivers develop cancers, and those cancers were indisputably linked to radioactivity. And this is a report passed to me from the radiation expert, um, served as the, as the legal expert in this case, um, and described these workers were regularly exposed without their knowledge to naturally occurring radioactive material in the course of their work through dust uh, in, ingestion, um, different pathways of exposure, and this is a list of some of the cancers that develop, they develop. And if you see that number on the right, so IREP, this is a program that was created by the CDC to analyze workers in the nuclear industry and determine whether or not their cancers were caused by radioactivity exposure. In these legal cases, that program was used to look at workers in the oil and gas industry and determine whether or not their cancers were caused by radioactivity exposure. And you can see the numbers. Um, so what that means in you know, a court of law, this is indisputable. The industry has settled all of these cases. You, they, they fought pretty hard on climate change and they continue to, but on the radioactivity issue, they cannot combat the science. They can give you a dishonest answer uh, in a one-on-one -on -one setting, but in a court of law, um, they back down on every single time because we, our government actually has analysis programs that can, you know, give us um, data such as this. Um, and I will stop there. And yeah, go to any questions that people might have. Yeah. I think the end point in this, it, 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 with this line of reporting is, is one, you know, geologists, geochemists, they've done a great job in trying to crack into this where they can. The health industry, a lot of the medical providers have not been able to give these workers straight answers. So I, I want to look at that industry. And then, yeah, I want to look at the people who are funding it. I don't know if it will necessarily fall in line, but I certainly want to try and take the reporting there. And it's, it's a really appropriate way because, right, how is all this being developed? I mean, right now you have um, the oil and gas industry, they look at brine 
as an economic opportunity. We look at it, I look at it, like this is horrendous. They're like the water problem, they'll call it. And you see all these articles, if you read the Houston Chronicle, the water problem in oil and gas is the next big boom. And right now, a lot of Wall Street companies are pumping money into companies in Texas and New Mexico and Pennsylvania that are trying to solve the water problem. Okay, we know injection wells are, are bad, communities are reacting to them, let's treat the brine. But this is, a, a, this is just another version of the disaster. The workers treating the brine are also not informed. And so all the Wall Street money that's been pumped into handling this waste issue um, is certainly only exposing people in a different way. It's not solving the problem, it's not solving the water problem. And, and yeah, I, I wish there was more journalists who would enter this sphere. Um, I work, I, I write also for Desmog, which is a great site that focuses uh, pretty much exclusively on the oil and gas industry. And they have a writer named Justin Mikoka, uh, another writer named Sharon Kelly. These writers are really good on this issue. I would read their work. But unfortunately, there's just not enough people um, writing on that topic. But it's, it's a great place to take um, a pair of investigative eyes and a good question. Yeah, the, so the book will be out with Simon & Schuster. Um, I'm moving as swiftly as I can, but I also feel it's important to convey the information as I go because it, it doesn't do anyone any good if I just you know, hide this all for the next three years. So it's gonna take at least two years. And I'll mention um, book funding for the book is, is being supported in part by a really great environmental or uh, journalism nonprofit called the Economic Hardship Reporting Project. Um, they support a lot of great journalism. So yeah, two years, but we'll be in touch, um, and maybe sooner if we can, um, yeah, organize our thoughts. Yes, yeah, so no, someone asked this question on Twitter, and I said, that is a trick question, because at least with the workers I'm dealing with, there are no unions in the oil and gas industry. Um, there is a steel workers union, and some of, the, some of the big petrochemical plants may have memberships there, but like people driving the trucks, uh, a lot of the you know frackers who work at the wellhead, um, no, there, there, there's nothing, and so this is why you can get to the situation where they're intimidated, and you know if they complain, they're fired, and, and of course you know I mean bloody battles have been fought to make sure that this doesn't happen in industries, but it is still happening in this industry. Yeah, uh, really great question. So let's try and find this little here we go little diagram I drew. Um, so yeah. Oddly enough, I don't necessarily think of it, but natural gas is a feedstock for um, plastic. So with natural gas, especially in parts of the Marcellus, you have natural gas liquids, um, which are just these heavier hydrocarbons that are also in the stream. And one of them is ethane. And ethane is quite valuable because ethane can be cracked uh, into ethylene, which means in a chemical process, a piece of it is knocked off. You no longer have ethane, you have ethylene. Ethylene at often a different plant or somewhere within the same plant can then be turned into polyethylene. And polyethylene is, is the beginning stage of many of the plastics we use. Um, so from polyethylene, you can make all sorts of plastics, you know, yogurt containers and cups and car dashboards. Um, but an important part is ethane. And it, it seems so simple, right? I mean, an ethane cracker plant is absolutely gigantic facility and what they're really doing is you know this kind of simple chemistry thing of, of, of really manipulating molecules um, but it's been done on a massive level and, and and there's a lot of chemistry that's happening there in physics um, and it needs a lot of space but but that's what's happening um, and so yeah to, to move the ethane to the facility you'll have a pipeline um, and then you have all sorts of components in an ethane cracker plant they're going to be processing um, material. So it, this comes up as an economics issue as well because right now there's a huge build out of petrochemical development happening in the areas of the Marcellus. Um, and so you know even if the price of gas goes down, um, you know maybe these companies can still make money. Shell is building a massive cracker plant right now in Beaver County, Pennsylvania. Um, so yeah, I think I think people, the journalists, journalists have gotten into this issue in, in, a, in a great way and, and are starting to highlight that fracking is connected in fact to plastics. Um, no, that would be a great thing because, uh, uh, yeah, it's, uh, they, um, they, they can't step to the science and so, for example, there's, this, uh, there's an organization called the Health Physics Society. They came out with a rebuttal to the Rolling Stone story, which was great that an industry group, or sorry, they're not an industry group, they're a group of, of scientists that they took the time to read it. 
and rebut it, but there was um, an error in the first paragraph of the rebuttal. In their rebuttal, they stated that there is no evidence that radioactivity in oil and gas production has ever harmed workers, and we have this set of legal cases with a very lengthy document explaining exactly how it did harm them and how those harms were tabulated. Um, so, no, I think that would be a great way to bring this out in the public. If you have uh, an idea on how to make it happen, um, let's stay in touch. And I'll let everyone know if we get to there. Yeah. What other areas did they attempt to rebut? The so, yeah, there's, there's one issue where we're still trying to figure out exactly what um, the correct way to describe the information is. And that's with these limits with the Department of Transportation. And in the story, we lay out that, so we talked about the exemption that allows um, something, that's has, something that's hazardous to be declared non-hazardous. And it turns out there is another way that a brine truck or some of these other trucks could get a placard, could get a hazardous um, marking on the truck. And that is if they have so much radioactivity that it actually triggers the DOT, the Department of Transportation's thresholds on radioactivity. And we had an expert who looked at those levels and said that the average Pennsylvania um, brine truck would be well above them. And they countered that and said, well, no, that's actually not the case, they're, they're lower. And so I've taken this argument to uh, a good contact I have at the Department of Transportation, and this was a month ago, and they haven't gotten back, and I'm you know, constantly trying to get them to give me an answer. So I don't, um, I'm not gonna, um, I'm not going to consider the case settled until I hear back from the Department of Transportation on whether or not we're right or whether or not um, they're right. So that, that was a big issue. Another issue, which is an important one, they said radium does not stick to dust uh, and that we were dramatizing this. Um, but I ran this by every single one of the scientists in the story. I looked back through the reports uh, and radium uh, and a lot of other toxic heavy metals, it's quite common that these things stick to dust. Uh, and so if you have brine spreading, when you're literally laying down um, brine with a radioactive signature onto a dirt, dusty road, um, you're creating just a horrendous exposure pathway. Um, and so it's quite significant that it does, um, and, but, but they tried to say that, that this was inaccurate, but it does not seem like the science is on their side there. Um, yeah. Yeah, um, it's devastating. There, there's a cancer cluster, an ongoing cancer cluster issue right now in southwestern Pennsylvania, where a lot of uh, young men and women, mostly young men, but some women too, teenagers, people in their early 20s, mid 20s, have developed Ewing sarcoma, a rare type of bone cancer. We do not know yet if this is connected to um, fracking. They also have a, an old uranium uh, mill site there that has a lot of buried waste. There are other issues to look at, but certainly if you know the science of what's happening with fracking, you want to look there. Um, and I'm working together with some local scientists and we are taking samples um, in various places and trying to examine this. So yeah, we're cracking into that problem. But um, just the issue of kids and fracking and what's happening um, it, it's really, it, it's devastating. If you go into any, I've never been to a family living next to a frag pad, and maybe at first they might say, no, it's all good, everything's fine, and talk to them for a little bit. Children wake up in the middle of the night with bloody noses, and not just, you know, a little bit of blood, I mean, blood gushing out, headaches, um, skin conditions develop, um, still waiting for someone to just, I mean, go through every valley in, in Pennsylvania, West Virginia. You're in an area where you have hollers, um, you know, these deep, steep valleys, and you have infrastructure often on top, and things settle in the night. Um, this is a really important question to look at, um, because often, um, you know, people that I talk to who are the sickest are people who are living down on the bottom of the hollers. So I, I think as this gets out more, um, hopefully more people will start to come forward, and also more people in the medical community will formally start to look and answer these questions. And there are some great people in the medical community who are looking, um, researchers at Penn State, researchers in Colorado. Um, there's a really great researcher at CUNY actually named Elizabeth Geltman, who's um, a legal and health expert. Um, and, and this is important to mention because they tell me, we want to do more research, but the funders don't even know about this issue. So it's difficult for us to get funding 
Um, for example, this issue of frac gas. Is there frac gas? Um, is it bringing a worrisome amount of radon into New York City apartments? Um, we don't know the answer to that. The study could be done with enough funding, um, and even people who want to do it have told me, you know, I can do that study. It's not hard scientifically, necessarily, um, but I don't have funding to do it. And so it, another reason why I think it's great to present this, when the people who give the funding start to become more aware of this, then the researchers can more easily get money, and then you know, answers will hopefully start to fall into place, or at least the picture gets filled in. Yeah. Um, yeah. Um, where are they? Where are they spreading the uh, brine? Uh, what places in America? Are they yeah. Great question. So, 13 states. Um, New York is included. It, the practice came to be uh, mostly in the Midwest, Northern Midwest, Upper Great Plains, and the Northeast. So, Pennsylvania, Ohio, and Michigan are three states where the practice is quite prominent. I have an article from a Michigan newspaper sent to me by a state geologist. It's from 1936, and it's uh, essentially celebrating the first instance of spreading of oil field brine on rose in Michigan. And the way it was sold and continues to be sold is that what a great way to get rid of this, you know, byproduct. Um, and this is something the industry will, you know, industry in general will do this time and again, mark or resell something that's hazardous as a product. And again, as much as we're trying to fight this, you have meetings right now regularly happening at the EPA where business people, entrepreneurs, which is great, they have ideas, but their ideas are, you know, turning this brine into other usable products. Let's find a use for it, then we won't have to put it down an injection well. So there's a huge push right now to make it even easier to spread brine on roads. But formal answer to your question, Ohio, Pennsylvania, and western parts of New York. Not necessarily in this area, it's typically gonna be in an area where there's a lot of oil and gas wells, because brine is a heavy liquid, and it'd be costly to transport it. Um, and it. And the way it came about was, you know, you have this brine, again, conventional oil and gas, well before fracking, produced this brine. It's coming up at their own gas well head. Uh, and you know that it has a lot of salt, so you connect with the local town official, and like, hey, we got a great product. It's essentially salt. You can use it. And for a lot of townships, snow and ice removal is one of their most significant costs. So this, I understand, the business allure of, wow, now we have our salt removal product for free, and the oil and gas people get rid of a waste product, and everyone's happy, but now in the year 2020, when the science knows a lot better, um, you know, it's a practice that absolutely needs to stop. Um, Can you sense radioactivity on these roads if you brought it? So this is, yeah, it's a great question. The, um, the levels, if you have, and this has been described to me by radiation experts, you know, if you go out with a Geiger counter on a road that's been brined and look for radioactivity and it starts ticking, you really have a problem. Often the radioactivity that we're talking about is at a level that won't necessarily trigger or trigger too much a Geiger counter, but if you take that sample back to a lab, you'll still show up with radium levels that could be well higher than, for example, you know, the levels at, the limit levels at a Superfund site. Um, so it's not necessarily going to answer um, a question. And, and right now, there are some scientists who are trying to find, you know, how can we look at roads and figure out whether worrisome levels of radioactive materials has accumulated. You can look at, like, storm drains, for example, places where a lot of sediment would accumulate. Um, but a big concern is, for a while, in Ohio, they were allowing a product that was made of oil field brine to be sold at Lowe's. So if you're a family and brought that product every year and you put it down on your walk and it's got a picture of a smiling dog on it and it says safe, you know, pet friendly, family friendly, and you put it down on your walk and you do it winter in, winter out, you know, what's happening there? Where is it going when it runs off? We don't know. That would certainly be a good place to look. Um, and um, no, no, great question. I don't know, but I will take that or um, direct you to, to email uh, Liz Geltman, who's a fantastic um, researcher at CUNY and has done some phenomenal research and has expressed interest in doing this study. I don't know the answer. It's a great, what, what do they need? Yeah, I would be um, curious because there's I a mean, lot of money out there. You know? Well, right. And I think, yeah, maybe there's, I mean, yeah, if one willing funder comes up, I'm not sure how their research process works and how they need validity. I mean, I think a lot of times they get government funding, which is helpful because then it, you know, you know that your research is going to get published in an appropriate place. A lot of those funding streams are drying up. Um, 
But, but that's a good question. So I will take that to the, the people I know who are willing to look into that. If you go through southwestern Pennsylvania, I mean, if you want to see this in action, um, you can take a road trip on I-70, and it will take you through the heart of the Marcellus shale boom. And you'll suddenly start to notice an incredible amount of trucks. And if you look to the side on a lot of highways, or if you pull off at a big interstate um, intersection where you have rest stops and fast food restaurants, you'll see signs uh, advertising for drivers. And this industry came around when there was a major economic slump happening across this area, um, the heart of the Marcellus, northern West Virginia, eastern Ohio, southwestern Pennsylvania. So um, it came around a time when a lot of people were looking for work. And a lot of people told me a very similar story, which is that like maybe they were working at a used car lot, or maybe they you know, were, were trying to make farming go, and farming is getting harder and harder in many parts of the country. And suddenly they would see someone who would like pull up in this big fancy Ford pickup, and they're like, where are you working? And they're like, I'm, I'm a brine hauler. This job's amazing. It's, only, it's 12 hours a day. We get a lot of overtime. We're usually just sitting in a truck, hauling around water. Um, and people were like, well, that, I want that job. And, and a lot of people with um, you know, enthusiasm took these jobs. Um, yeah, uh, or with, yeah, was there a question? The major way that radioactivity we know already is indeed getting into waterways in Pennsylvania is through this pathway of, um, of the drill cuttings. So um, with fracking, you are drilling um, through a black shale. Uh, and a black shale is, um, that's the mother load for all oil and gas. If you think of a shallow marine environment like the Gulf of Mexico right now, you have a lot of dead organic material like marine algae falling to the bottom. It accumulates, and this rich dead organic material in the future, that is literally, that will be your oil and gas. Um, also accumulating in that same area is uranium-238 and thorium-232. These are two long-lived radioactive elements. So when we talk about conventional oil and gas, it's oil or gas that's escaped out of the black shale, and it's sitting basically in a pocket in the earth, what the industry calls a trap. It's easy to drill into. You stick a drill in, um, relatively easier at least, uh, and it will fountain out. Think of like you know um, West Texas oil, like flowing out. That's conventional oil. Fracking isn't like that. Fracking, you have to drill into it, and you have to do this complicated process of fracking. But with fracking, unlike with conventional oil, we're actually going down to the layer of the black shale. And if you think about fracking, you drill vertically down, and then you drill horizontally. So we're drilling vertically down, we're drilling horizontally for a mile or two miles through a known radioactive layer. All of the material brought up with the drilling, what's called drill cuttings, this material will all have to go somewhere. Again, same exemption, even though it can have high levels. In this case, we're actually, forget about the, ra the radium, we're bringing up the uranium itself and the thorium, but this material is non-hazardous by U.S. law, and right now it's being dumped in the hundreds of thousands of tons a year in municipal landfills meant for household garbage across West Virginia, Ohio, and Pennsylvania. These landfills produce leachate, which is this toxic liquid gunk that any landfill produces. You know, if it rains on a landfill, where does that go? It mixes in with the landfill, and there's these collection systems for leachate. So what's happening now with these landfills is this leachate is picking up radium. Again, if you have uranium, it's not necessarily going to flow with water, but the uranium decays to radium. Radium's in the leachate. The leachate then goes to a sewage treatment plant. It processes it, but it cannot process out the radium, and it discharges into a waterway, into the Monongahela River, for example, which flows through downtown Pittsburgh, uh, into creeks that people fish in. So this is a way that right now with a really great Pennsylvania journalism group called Public Herald, and, and we're looking at these issues and, and trying to determine um, how much radioactivity is accumulating. But that's how it is getting into waterways. Unfortunately, you know, again, not enough people looking into it, but we do have some great scientists who are working and we're starting to look into that there. And just, um, I mean, yeah, a really, um, it's, it's relevant to mention, it's horrible, where a lot of people, Pennsylvania is a big fishing and hunting state, so what we found as we spent time in these areas is that at these outfalls, so the sewage plant taking this leachate, it has radium, and even if it's a minor level of radium, again, it's still above these limit levels, and the discharges into a stream 
And at that point, you create like a little pool, and this is exactly where kids are fishing. Because you want to fish where, you know, A, where two streams meet, there can be more nutrients, and this can be a nutrient-rich material coming from a landfill. It digs a little hole, the fish trout-like holes. So this is an incredibly um, concerning problem. And I'm just gonna, I'm gonna go to the next question, but I'm gonna leave this slide here because this is um, showing that we have known for quite a long time that black shales are radioactive. So oil yield and uranium content of black shales, 1960, a report done by the US Geological Survey, but see who it was done for, for the Atomic Energy Commission. And, um, and these are some quotes. So that, again, it is not news um, that radioactivity is there. It in fact, if you, if you have a high organic content in a black shale, you will inherently likely have a high radioactivity content. And these quotes explain that. Um, and yeah, there was questions maybe moving back down the line. Okay, yeah. Oh, pool salts. Um, you know, there, there's a company that is trying to turn the brine into pool salts. Um, the levels, it, the levels that um, a little bit of research has been done on this, um, and they did not necessarily find radium. Um, I, I don't think it's appropriate to comment on the pool salts issue until more science, more data has been collected. Yeah. But it is, I think what's concerning is that you have seen the regulatory structure of this industry. You have seen how much oversight they have. And so try to imagine an entrepreneur, which is fine, you know, let's make some money, have a business, entering this regulatory black hole. They want to make a product. They want to turn brine, which is one of the world's most complex liquids. Um, it's got all this toxicity and this radioactivity, and they want to turn that into pool salts. Okay, that's going to be a very tricky process, um, and so I'm going to be comp you know, very critical. Uh, and I think uh, the, the amount of pr monitoring that would have to go into that facility would be extraordinary, um, and you've seen the type of monitoring that's happening. So. I, I think you know we need to look at that for sure, but I, I don't know if the data is there yet to say like should we stop buying all pool salts? Um, but but certainly that's you know all of these pathways where folks are trying to make products out of this should definitely be examined. Um, a question further back, yeah. Right, with the gutting of the EPA at the federal level and all the the Clean Water Act and all of that. Do you see any possibility of anybody being able to regulate any of this stuff on the state level or so on, or have any, have any states done this? Yeah, yeah, so right, it becomes hopeless, um, but there's quite a lot of hope. So the first thing I'll mention is that um, that exemption went through every single administration. Um, uh, Benson and Bevel, they were actually both Democrats. Um, Benson was a Texas senator who later served as Bill Clinton's Secretary of Treasury. Um, no one on the federal, on the presidential level has lifted a finger, and right, the EPA has stayed pretty lax. Local people and communities across the political spectrum, um, whether it's me telling them or them seeing it with their own eyes, they get this issue. Uh, and sure, the industry is trying to downplay the science, downplay the risks, but um, I spoke on a conservative radio station in West Virginia. I thought this was gonna go really bad. I looked at the person's Twitter, I was like, oh boy. Um, and they got it. And they were like, you know, next time you're in town, uh, come back for an hour. We need to hear this information. And on the local level, when community members have been activated, they have been able to do incredible things. So just one case with the brine, um, one person, and there are groups in Ohio that have been fighting brine for a long time, really great local groups, Buckeye Environmental Network, one of them, many groups. Um, and there was a woman who lives in a town called Medina. She was at the talk. She was blown away by this. She went to her township meeting the next week um, and just laid out the science, and they banned brine spreading in that community, which sent shockwaves across um, Ohio because suddenly the industry is like, wait a minute, or, you know, is this going to be... Um, like a snowball effect. So, you know, I would say, yeah, the, the hope is, you know, for now at least, forget about the EPA, go local, and if there's something happening in your own area, you know, use knowledge, use the science, and bring it to, a, like, a, you know, decision maker. And when you get your foot in that door, then, you know, push through to the next bigger door and go from the bottom up. Um, but, a, yeah, great question. Yeah, right. It's <laughs> a good question. Um, my partner's here tonight, she can probably answer that better. I mean, it's hard. It's like, 
yeah, I come back, each trip is devastating, and, it, and it's like, you know, toxicity literally, and just through stories built up inside you, I think that's something a lot of journalists or storytellers, you know, health professionals deal with, um, social workers. Um, I, what I do is I'm, I'm making a trail, I just go in the woods, and, I'm, and I, we live way upstate, and I'm trying to build a trail across all of Columbia County using deer trails and following animal paths. Um, and that makes me really happy, and I feel like there's order in that. <laughs> um, and, I, um, and, and that is, you know, like getting into nature is certainly a way to help uh, react to this. But I think what's important is to focus on the people in the communities who are fighting these issues and recognize that many of them, you know, I chose this as a path, as an interesting career path. Many of them, again, they're not activists, they're people who suddenly decide to open their eyes. And then they enter this role that they did not plan to, and the courage that they show, and the energy that they show is, is actually very inspiring. And it's a very beautiful thing. And you know, these people become um, you know, friends, um, not in a way that you know, would like, jeopardize the reporting, but in a way that actually makes it better, because you recognize them as human beings uh, and their stories are so significant. So I think if you're, you know, if you want, I, again, will put the call out to journalists to enter this sphere, but you certainly have to be excited about talking to people like that. And it is difficult, and there's no easy way, but I think, you know, as, as, human, as, as human interactions go, hearing these stories um, has a value that, that isn't always dark. It actually can be, um, quite wonderful to see someone and to see, you know, how people can come together and, and take something like this on. Yeah, um, up front. Yeah, yeah. So there's amazing groups in in all of these communities. And again, you know what I said at the beginning. So in southeastern Ohio, there's a group called Torch Can Do. Um, you know, this would be what would be called um, Trump Country, uh, rural Ohio. Um, you know, very different than um, what you know it looks like outside here in New York City. Um, these people have a major injection well. They have kids. They they love the environment, and they have come together. No one told them to form Torch Can Do. This is a group of uh, mostly mothers who realize that no one was going to help them, uh, and so they decided to help themselves. And what they do, and it is horrible that it comes to this. Torch Can Do members have test kits in their car. They've been trained on how to sample, on how to take an appropriate sample. So when a brine truck crashes, they crash regularly, um, they know that Ohio EPA isn't gonna get anything or they're not gonna get answers, even if samples are taken where they're done appropriately. So they have been trained to, you know, they have a call group, go to a site as soon as they can and as safely as they can try and get a sample and then get it to an appropriate lab. I mean, these groups are literally doing the job um, of the regulators. And there's groups like that across the board, um, especially in the Northeast. One, yeah, I mean, in every state where this is going. In some states, the, the, the resistance is more organized. Um, one interesting state was North Dakota. There are some great groups. There's a group called um, North Dakota Resource Council uh, and some other folks. But um, you, know, you do see how mentalities change across the country. And there are some states that have long been oil and gas states um, I don't know exactly what's at work in some of these states, but where people are just more likely to let someone um, who has authority trample on them, and that's really devastating. And this is something that's come up time and again, you know, like someone with a, like, don't tread on me sticker on their car, and they want the rights, that's fine, but do you think those people are the ones standing up to the oil and gas industry in rural America? Um, at least in my experience, very often it has not been them. You know, it's um, you know often women and often people who you know would be the last one to put up like a "Don't trample on my rights" sign. They clearly care about the rights, but they're the real heroes in this, and they exist in every state in some way or form. Yeah. So yeah, I mean, all of these things. They'll try and call the Ohio EPA, yeah. say, "Hey, there was a crash. We got numbers back, and the arsenic is high, and our." You know, there's a stream right there that goes through a farmer's field. What are you going to do? And maybe they don't get callbacks, and then they go to, yeah, they go to their local city council meeting, 
and they take the sample or they take the data from the sample um, and just try and uh, get it in front of people's faces. I mean, that's exactly what they do. Often doors are shut, um, but what's nice about putting this information out in the way that I've been able to do with this story and putting it out couched in science and putting it out couched in the industry's own science often is these people now have a stronger um, you know, toolkit. And, um, and again, that's also the idea with the radioactive cookbook. Give people a stronger toolkit so whoever is in charge is less likely to ignore you. And also, I mean, some really, and this answers the question from back here, there are some amazing new politicians, uh, a lot in southeastern Pennsylvania, also in southwestern Pennsylvania, who have run on this issue. There's an amazing woman in southwestern Pennsylvania, Sarah, Sarah Enamorado. She represents a district uh, in the Pittsburgh area. Um, she, if you, I mean, if you want to see an eloquent response to the petrochemical industry, read the op-ed that Sarah Enamorado just wrote in the Pittsburgh Post-Gazette. It's brilliant. Right now, legislators are trying to give all this money to this industry, and she dismantles that in such a powerful way. So there are new people with new ideas who have used this, you know, the, uh, the observation of these horrors to help inspire them, and, and they're entering office now. And, and I think that is happening more and more. Um, and, um, you know, I know a lot of folks in across Pennsylvania were very upset at this New York Times article that came out recently saying, supporting a ban on fracking is a losing proposition in Pennsylvania. I, I, I mean, like any reporter who spent time there knows that across the spectrum, if people who have been touched by this industry uh, are, are very critical of it right now. And again, the way that I would advise going about it is, you know, we don't even have to, we can dismantle this wedge of workers versus environmentalists. Their workers are getting sick. Their workers are being lied to. They're deceiving their workers. The workers are on, on the side of the people fighting for the environment. They're on the same team, and industry has long tried to pit those groups against one another. But yet, you know, more and more it, that comes out, it shows that the workers are actually quite at risk. Yeah. Yeah, so which is why, I mean, I'd say, you know, and they do great work on a lot of issues, but yeah, I mean, they should have someone um, covering fracking as if it were a war, as if it were a conflict environment. They should have a bureau there. Um, but there's other great outlets. So read Public Herald, read the Smog, and all sorts of other more grassroots uh, organizations that are really covering this issue well. Yeah. I think with politics, a lot of it ends up being local. Those dumps are in the southern tier of New York, primarily. Um, and there are some people, uh, great groups again, who are fighting those dumps um, and have had some successes. Um, again, it's a difficult fight because if you are going to frack, you are going to produce drill cuttings. They have to go somewhere. We just saw a situation in Oregon where they were sneaking waste from North Dakota all the way to Oregon. So it's you know you can't just stop it. It's coming up, um, and it's and it's hard to um, you know even if Nor even if New York were to say no more drill cuttings, no more oil and gas waste being accepted, a you're still going to have the landfills that already have the stuff, and then some other states just going to get the burden. But I think. Um, in terms of finding an issue in New York that resonates, um, resonates you know across the board, I think focusing on pipelines could be a you know is a good way. Focusing on um, on this issue of radon and gas, I mean this at least needs to be examined. And you know if the science tells us that you know what it's fine and it's all building up in the pipelines and that's another issue you know but the homes are okay you know that's fine let, let the science lead us there but th this is an issue that could affect anyone who has natural gas um, you know as a as their cooking fuel which is most of New York City and the issue in New York City is for one you have people um, who would um, and this is something, you know, that's, we, when I lived in New Orleans, this is really common. You use your gas stove to heat your home, um, which is not good because you emit a lot of vapors, but um, there's not good heating in, in Louisiana, and I know people do this in other areas. So what if you leave the stove on, stove on for like many hours of the day, or at night while you're sleeping and to like warm your kitchen? You know, because when they do test stuff and they'll say, the average person uses this much gas and we add up the numbers, it's not high. Another issue that the tests have not seen, and, and again, when I say test, this one study from 1973, is this idea of if you have a New York high rise with a lot of apartments and every single one of them has a gas stove and every single one 
one of them is on frack gas, and we don't know the levels, and they all turn their stove on at six o'clock to cook dinner, um, what's happening there? Where, where's, we know a little bit of rayons coming out. Where is it going? Where is it accumulating? I think that's a good segue. Yeah. Laura and I talked about the legislation. Super, super. To okay. Yeah. Great, great to be into that. Yeah. <laughs> Um, yeah, thank you. And, and this is a great answer to all the people wondering, you know, what to do. I mean, you all, you, you all explain this, but the, here is a way to take it, to take the science, to get an ally in the legislature, and try and get answers, and even in getting answers, you build awareness. So, yeah. super. Um, another round for Justin Nogal. Thank you. Yes. So great, grateful that you came here.